Thank you for your next step. Um, I'm Lucy Munro. Um, I'm absolutely delighted to introduce our first plenary speaker at this conference, Professor Lee Hutton. Lee is Professor of Early Modern English Literature at the University of University Bristol Bonneville. She's been out for a number of she is now a working critic and editor, which ranges across late 16th and 17th century literary cultures, lending to each era of scholarship a characteristic blend of insight, elegance, and rhythm. Lee is the author of Monograph on the Politics of Worship to Wonder and Power and Poetry, Le Fisi Regard, the Posi and Verdi Baroque for Classicism. Published in 1997, and she's written extensively on 17th century literature. Um, in her words, from William Shakespeare and Walter Raleigh to Margaret Cavendish, Arthur Ben, and Mary Aston. She has collected a series of very valuable collections, including Authorial Complex, Essays on Genre in the Writings of Margaret Cavendish, edited by Nancy Bites, and published in 2003, Women and Curiosity in England and France, edited with Sondrine Perigold. And published in 2016, and Henry V, a critical guide, edited with Clara Britland, which was published in 2018. Lean has also made crucial contributions to textual scholarship. He's edited 15 plays for the bilingual Galima, complete works of Shakespeare, and Henry IV, part two, for the Norton Shakespeare third edition, which was published in 2016. She's also editor with Mary Alice Bell of two closet plays. Mary Sidney Herbert Antonius and Thomas Fitz Cornelia, published in Modern Humanities Research Association's Tudor and Stuart Translation Series in 2017 as Robert Garnier in Elizabethan England. Lean's current research focuses on the Dior Shakespeare and on Acrobens translations for the threat from the French, and she's editing three works, La Monde, Elias de Castro, and Discovery of New Worlds for the Cambridge Complete Works of Acrobens. General Edgeford by Lane Bobby, by Baldrige, and Billion Wright. Her talk today is entitled The First Folio and the Invention of Serial Shakespeare, The Case of the Henry VI, Parts 1, 2, and 3. Please join me in welcoming. A, a very kind introduction. So I'm, I'm delighted to be here today. And these are um, sort of like current thoughts on um, seriality, which is a problem I have, I've been working on for, for a long time now. But of course, it's work in progress. And I welcome um, suggestions and, and um, the discussion afterwards. Okay. Um, so as we've already heard, one of the most important critical interventions of the Supreme portfolio is its organization of the plays of different genres, uh, a move which creates a neat symmetry within three roughly equivalent sets of plays. It was not an obvious strategy to follow, as we've heard, the Johnson folio uh, chooses a completely different strategy. The neat division in dramatic genres um, has durably affected our reception of Bacon's plays, although in some cases labeling was problematic when they were discussed it. Why uh, are Richard II and Richard III formally designated as tragedy when printed in, in, as in the report tone listing listed in all histories? While a play like Macbeth, like Macbeth, is treated as a tragedy, although it could equally have been integrated into the streets, for instance. But I think it's a, it's actually um, the critical history, the, the critical history of the history that has been most dramatically impacted by the famous editorial choices, focusing on the late medieval English history, if we exclude the ancient Rome, ancient Britain, Scotland, Denmark. The famous editors ignored the order of composition and publication and published the histories as a sequence beginning with King John and ending with Henry VIII following the chronology of events. The effect was to emphasize the impressive number of plays written by Shakespeare on English history in respect to the rest of his works, 10 plays and 36. And thus it made of Shakespeare a historian of the English nation. It also highlights the existence of a central eight-play series 
can bring a continuous historical sequence of one century, from Richard the Second's last years to the fall of Richard the Third, a set which has since the 1940s and Hilliard been conveniently broken up into two symmetrical decalogies. The decalogy, of course, needs to be historicized and identified to reduce the rigid for ancient drama. And it is a dated critical concept, although it's been endorsed by most critics, and it's actually quite useful. Yeah, but whether Shakespeare himself wrote the plays in sets of four is, of course, practically debated as I would show. By highlighting a set of eight plays on the medieval history of England, the photos editors encourage the readers to read this play at multiple parts of the whole and literally invented the notion of a serial Shakespeare, which modern authors and stage directors have found so productive of the work. But editors have argued since the living that this does not reflect at all the order of composition and performance. And it seems established that the eight plays were written and first performed over a period of nine or ten years between 1590 and 1599. The question of the author's intentionality behind this master plan, this master plan can legitimately be raised once again. Intentionality has often been dismissed as irrelevant. The end result is a series of plays which you more or less cover the material of the chronicles in a continuous manner. But what is at stake is the amount of editing and revision that was involved to make the series glide more or less smoothly from one episode into the next, not to mention whether each of these plays must be read as a number in the series or not. In light of the current scholarship of the histories, the focus emphasis on a smoothened out, seemingly unproblematic historical series is looking more and more like the product of an editorial rather than an authorial to the course. To try and evaluate the extent of the focus emphasis, the focus editors' agents, we need to have it to be more specific, difficult to um, reason to have a, you know, an overall global view. Here I want to look at the trilogy numbered sequentially in the photo, first part, second part, and third part of Henry the Sixth. And after reconsidering the evidence and what can reasonably be inferred about performance and publication of history, I will turn to the textual strategy perhaps followed by the photo editors. Um, my talk proceeds from the conviction that seriality, which is routinely invoked today, must be problematized. Recent productions of the play and uh, of the place as a sequence have shown that they do stand the test of performance in as a continuous sequence with a certain amount of tinkering. The latest production today is probably to measure these uh, marathon performance of the three parts of Pain the Six, followed by Richard the Third over 24 hours last June, with 18 hours of show proper, especially breaks in Aussie. Yet there's still no evidence that the plays of the series were ever performed on consecutive days. Besides, as is well known, the plays were not written in the order of historical events, with the first technology being that later event than the second. After three centuries of poring over the same fragmentary evidence, hence those diaries, those testimonies, and bibliographical records, we must admit that no real consensus has emerged about the dates and order of composition or performance of Shakespeare's plays as a whole, and that little is known about Shakespeare's early London years. The two latest complete works, the new Oxford Shakespeare 20, 2016 and the latest edition of the RSC complete works 2022, still provide different chronologies, including, including for the histories. They both agree that the first part of Henry the Sixth was written as a prequel for the second and third parts, although this relies on identifying Henslow's Harry the Sixth as this as the old version of what was to become the first part of Henry the Sixth of the period. <laughs> what immediately stares us in the face of, and at the point of entry into the notion of seriality, is the existence of two victims. As reflected in the early titles, the first part of the contention. Oops, sorry, it's confusion. I don't know what's happened there. Um, sorry, that. 
So the first part of the convention, published in 1594, is followed by the true tragedy of Richard of York and the lesser group in Kansas City, with the whole convention, published in 1595. The second diptych, of course, the history of Henry IV, published in 1598, followed by the second part of Henry IV, published in 1600. The two plays of the contention were later gathered by Thomas Pavier um, in as a two as a ten act play entitled "The Hall of Contention" between the two famous houses, Lancaster and York. Um, but I'll come back to this in a minute. But how do we bridge the gap between these pairs and the six eight play series that's presented in the podium? Now we've gone a long way since we did, but after the most recent heated debate among Disintegrators. I, I know this is here a plenary term, term used by, I mean, created by UK Chambers in the 1920s and very recently um, revised by Paola Filiati. Um, so to designate scholars who consistently question um, Shakespeare's authorship. But how far can we trust after all this work that's been done? How far can we trust the film to give us Shakespeare according to the true original copies, its true original form? Um, we have to summarize the entire book um, that has been the product of the new textual scholarship. I quote. The attempts to construct a reliable, firm, and durable canon ended up producing a multiplication and a dispersal, not only of texts and parts of texts, but also of authorial images and identities. So, where does the current theological disintegration leave us in respect to our perception of the program today? And what bearing does it have on the construction of a serial chainsaw? The current critical discourse, its emphasis on collaborative authorship, its scrutiny of early texts and issues of early performance, can only lead to question of the authenticity and credentials of the posthumous scholar and the underlying editorial planning that went into. So, plays about the history of Indian were obviously extremely popular in Elizabethan England. It was that between 1560 and 1642, more than 150 plays dealt with the history of England, with more than half of these written and performed in the 1590s. Seven of the eight plays of Shakespeare's stupid tragedy appeared in print before 1600. Out of the 10 plays now attributed to Shakespeare that have appeared that by that date. In his uh, 2002 uh, study, Nicholas Reed and Catholic Serial Shakespeare, Nicholas Reed, basing himself on external and internal evidence, has argued more specifically that the four plays of Shakespeare's first technology were, I quote, designed with serial production of the plays in mind. But that the second tragedy was more loosely organized and did not follow that pattern. And he added that so the first tragedy constituted an interlocking series, and that the plays would, I could again, almost certainly have been put forward as a series in the 1590s. There is no evidence, however, that the four plays of the first tragedy were ever performed on consecutive days or even as a loose series at any time. A close examination of the national records so it simply rules this out. The two plays later published as the first part of the contention and the two tragedy of Richard Duke of York, featured second and third parts, were first performed by the Earl of Pembroke's men before Lance, the Lord Strang's men acquired its prequel, Harry the Sixth, which was performed as a rose theater in the spring of 1592. Although Harry the Sixth appeared to have been very successful on the stage, it was apparently not published. Marked in Henslow's diaries, which are still our main source of information about its theatrical life as the name, which has been interpreted totally as new or newly licensed, the play was performed 15 times at the Globe, as the Rose, sorry, between March 1591-92 and June 1592 shortly before the theatres were closed to kick us the play. None of them were closed between June 1592 and May 1594 with a brief interruption in late December 1592 and early 1594. 
We know that the true tragedy of Richard, Duke of York, was well known by the summer of 1592, which is when Robert Greene, who died on September 3rd, the story is well known, accused Shakespeare of plagiary in Greene's. Um, In Green's Grossworth of Wit, paraphrasing the line of the book, he famous, famously described Shakespeare as an upstart crow beautified his out feathers, which like his tigers heart wrapped in paste by a light and third part of the lips. This comment is, suggests that the two Captain Richard and formed the first half of the convention to were performed before March 1592, when Harry was opened, and possibly the year before. The extraordinary success of Harry's success the rose in the spring of 1592, yielded over 33,000 weak interpreting social records rights, did not prompt from joint or consecutive performance of the place for which it was allegedly a prequel. Also, to be fair, this is Information might not be available to us if it's effects or own the effects or own by Pembroke's. We know what's more that Pembroke's men went on to work with the second and third parts of Henry VI, future second and third parts, when the play of the broke out in 1952. Whatever happened, the hypothesis that a few plays might have been conceived as a trilogy or performed as such takes a beating since. The first part of the convention and the true tragedy of Richard um, had obviously an independent life of their own as a two part set and belonged to a different company. Rosalind Knudsen even suggests that the first part of the convention might have received this title as a way of marking its precedence, presumably so it would appear to be firmly dissociated from the Lord Steinsman's alleged equal. In a competitive context, therefore. This might indicate that Harry the Sixth, if indeed it is the play that eventually became the start of the portfolio, might have originally been written by a team of authors, and why not Marlowe Nash and the third unidentified author, as suggested by the Oxford editors, for the Lord Strikes Men as an opportunistic attempt to capitalize on the recent success of the diptych. Performed by a different company, Pembroke's men. It is, of course, possible that the young Shakespeare had a hand in this early version, but this was at the time when he was also being accused of having borrowed indelicately from his fellow authors, among whom Marlowe again, for the other two. Anyway, Henry Penslow, as a theatrical entrepreneur, um, gives us a wealth of information about how the media worked. He acquired, he acquired texts for his company in two ways, either by buying the texts up front or by commissioning them from a team of authors, more rarely from World Wars, actually. These papers, as we know, brought a whole series of advanced payments to authors' plays, which are often follows up, I'm sorry, follow-ups of sequels of plays that have been successful on the stage in the hope, in the hope of capitalizing. That's it. The Rose and then Fortune, which he invented, hosted several playing companies over the years. The Lord Spans Men, 1592 93, The Sustitute Men, 1994, The Queen's Men, 94, and then Lord Admiral's Men for seven years. Not unsurprisingly, their repertories um, have a lot of overlap. They include a fair number of plays about the history of England. And two in particular that have connections with the reign of Henry VI and antedate actually Shakespeare's own versions. The first one is the anonymous Little Tragedy of the Third, performed by the Queen's Men in 1594 and entered into the St. King's Register in June of that year. The other is an anonymous play performed by the Lord, the Lord the Admiral's Men, How is it fits? I think the play is victory of the of this, first performed in November 1995, which was obviously a theatrical success and went through 13 performances. These two plays incidentally make a shape of a follow up rather than um, a leader. 
This competitive market suggests indeed that Hensler's Harry the Six could very well have been interesting to serve from the popularity of the first class of contention and the tragedy of Richard Duke of York. But this, of course, still does not rule out the possibility that, that Shakespeare later might, that might later have revised the place for the rerun with or without his violation of the party control. Hensel's papers confirm, therefore, that planned seriality was not the norm for his fears in the late 16th century. But this suggests two concomitant, concomitant phenomena. First, the great number of related plays, plays on similar topics. And secondly, the great number of pairs and diptychs. In the competitive environment of the London theatres, it seems clear that any play that met, that met with public applause was likely to generate sequels, analogs, spin offs, including with rival companies. This creates a sense of false theoreality, if you like, that is contingent rather than the result of a premeditated plan. Critical consensus is that the sound and effect of the two parts of Marlowe's family, performed by the Admirals in 1587-88, created somewhat of a vogue for plays and pairs. According to, according to Green's estimate, 41 pairs were performed between 1588 and 16. From Hensel's record, we learned that in 1594 and 95, the two parts of Cambalet were performed seven times on consecutive days, about once a month in the play of season. Although both parts were also performed separately over the period. Most successful plays were given in Super. Hence, those papers have recorded several instances where the commission authors to write a second part for plays that have just been performed. He thus ordered um, a second part for Robin Hood, page to check on Monday, Tampa Chan in April 1592, Hercules 1595, Seems 1906, The Younger Women, Babington 1998, Henry Richmond, which is lost in 1599. And of course, sometimes spin offs have different titles um, from the ones the first part. The Spanish tragedies, one of the most famous cases, one of the greatest sellers in the period, but in work, which was given a prequel entitled Jerome in 1500. In most cases, the second part was performed within weeks of the first, a few times in its own. Then, in alteration, is the first part, and occasionally. Um, very occasionally on two consecutive days. Public demand seems to have been what determined such decisions. There are in Hendler's papers two other, perhaps more unusual cases, which point to longer series. The play Thomas Strout, Lost, was given three parts, and titled the second part and the third part of the play. Again, however, the record suggests that only the success of the previous section caused the following one to come into view. The most intriguing case, however, is an act of tragedy now lost, the civil wars of France, three installments of which were ordered in quick succession for the admiral's men between November 1598 and January 1598-99. Hence the papers records paying, paying the stage box for the performance of the first Civil War of France in October 1998. So it's presumably performed that month. Then come in quick succession a payment for Drayton and Beckham for a book called The Second Part of the Civil Wars of France. So a number in, in November 1998. And the down payment to Beckham in the third part of the Civil Wars of France in November. The rest paid both Decker and Beijing on the 30th of December till 1598. And finally, a play Hensler calls the first introduction of the civil wars of France was commissioned from Decker in January, as a, a, in the following January. It seems that the unabating success of Marlowe's Matador at Paris had whetted Plato's appetite for more about the French civil wars, and that Henslow was hoping for a repeat of an earlier success. Unfortunately, the plays are no longer extant, and we have no indication about whether they 
performed on consecutive days at any point, and in what configuration. Um, and they constitute, however, the only instance of an unreasoned totality which was conceived as such over a relatively short period of time. But you see, even in this case, Henson's papers show that the first two parts were immediately conceived as a dictum. But the following installments, again, were produced one at a time because the preceding part met with public opinion. The absence of an overall planning can be inferred from the fact that the introduction came last as a paper. It would probably have been seen uh, as an opportunity to rekindle interest in the first and second parts, which might have been more successful than the third. It seems clear by now that, that the question of similarity must be considered not from a historical or artistic perspective, but from a more contingent, market oriented one. In most cases, in this highly contested theatrical milieu, commissioning a Seacock for a play was a commercially motivated decision determined by financial aspects. Moreover, Subject matters came first before the identities of the authors, which seemed to have been considered unimportant in the late 16th century. In Hensler's papers, the names of the authors are not always mentioned, for instance. This is also true of first quartets with the serial history, the early serial histories. In the late 16th and early 17th century, a few London stations, however, moved to buying. Uh, titles that they would be able to sell together as a formal set. To these stationers, seriality was considered as a marketing, and for these stationers, seriality was a marketing asset. One way of multiplying the number of sales, if you like, by bringing the same customers back repeatedly, by publishing a community series of little books, each one a low, low in price, but you know, to be imagined something in its words. Three stations in particular uh, invested in serial histories that are relevant to this history I'm trying to trace. Thomas Millington capitalized on Shakespeare's first value, Andrew Rice on the second, and Thomas Javier, who may argue paved the way for the folio's entries. Andrew Weiss published four serial history imported forms between 1597 and 1602, and he could have done work. Richard II, Richard III, the first, the first parts of Henry IV, and the second part of Henry IV. Um, after he entered into business with the Lord Champion's men. According to Terry Lyons, Weiss was investing. Um, Primarily into a popular list of plays before publishing an author, Shakespeare, which can be derived perhaps from the fact that the first photos of Richard II, Richard III, and the history of Henry IV, respectively 1597 and 98, were issued without the author's name, contrary to the following editions, which advertised the name of Shakespeare. This suggests that the name of Shakespeare was slowly becoming a selling asset, but that it was not yet primarily the justification for wise to acquire these steps. A few years earlier, Thomas Millington, who had published the first quarto of the first part of the contention and the first edition of the true tragedy of Richard, we could do as an octavo, which he bought from Cambridge. The two different formats might suggest that Millington initially envisaged selling the two parts separately. There was no mention of the author's name, which is not a surprise. The texts were entered in the station as registered for the first time for the first on, in March 1594, and for the second part only seven years later, seven years later, in April 1602, when Millington transfers the rights to the two titles to Thomas. In the meantime, Millington had issued a second edition of the two titles in 1600. This one goes as fortunate. He had also acquired another piece of the jigsaw puzzle 
with his drawing publication, his drawing mystery of Shakespeare's The Chronicle of His and Fifth published anonymously is Rotundia. The serial histories were economically viable in the same sense. It's obvious in the role play by Thomas Savior in this story. Before he secured the right to the first and second part of him, the six two books, as is mentioned in the statement of service, that had had acquired those to him the fifth in August 1600, which he published separately in 1602. This was an investment in the future, as it turns out, Avia, working in association with Prince William Jagarat, later gathered the photos that had applied and published them as a collection of 10 plays in 1619, well known, under the sole name of Shakespeare. Um, it's not really the place to discuss this fascinating passage of the Napoleon, but let it suffice to say that it is a non spoke volume. Um, quarter editions sold separately, but also sold assembled in a bound volume. Um, it was obviously meant to be uh, for a leadership of more accurate readers or collectors. Um, and um, as seen above, Pavia merged the two parts of the contention by adding a title page presenting them as one play in two parts under the title of one contention. Newly corrected and enlarged and written by William Shakespeare. Here, however, what I'm finding is, is that the idea of seniority takes a new turn. Um, the last 1619 volume, sometimes known as Hagia's Fool's Failure, is indeed the first collection entirely dedicated to Shakespeare, you know, although it includes plays that were not his. And it also contains several histories. Would be a de facto series, if you like, although not presented as such. Uh, the volume also included Kenneth Graves, um, Sir John Walt Castle, the plays that's actually not by Shakespeare, but by, by Mandir, Drayton, Drayton and, and other, and The Merry Wives of Windsor, which can be considered as a spin off um, of Penis and Force Part Two. So it, it appears that the first part of the contention. And the true tragedy of Richard Heath of York were also successful in print, not just on the stage. Not as successful, however, um, as Henry IV Part One, which went from 11 editions to 1652. So, serial histories were popular among readers who collected play texts, as is confirmed by the few surviving Zandbender, such as the one spoken by Terry Lyons. Tomorrow, which tends to show that readers who bought one history play were likely to buy more and to actually gather them in a cluster, irrespective of the author's name. The seriality is also a criterion for ordering and gathering early modern play texts for early collectors and readers. Okay. So where do we go from there? It's obvious that the editorial packaging of the program meant to enhance the continuity and sequentiality of the four plays on the study. But it's possible, but is it possible to identify revisions that would suggest a desire to improve the continuity between the various episodes and to enhance the unity of the whole? This is obviously a vexed question for the first part of the analysis, because the third text is all we have. So the answer is we don't know and we will never know. The new Oxford Shakespeare the editors suggest that Shakespeare had initially written to do with the bulk of the text, which is authored by Marlowe, Nash, and an anonymous third author, although they argue it was revised by Shakespeare at some point. Whether other hands had something to do with the resulting failure text as well is quite possible. One of the scenes that is securely attributed to Shakespeare. The Temple Garden scene in Act Two, Scene One, from um, the second part, clearly uh, of the first part, clearly looks forward to the second part of Henry VI. It is an imaginative introduction to the later Civil Wars of the Roses and the symbolic badges of the white and red roses. Although the relevance of the scene can only uh, be understood much later. So. 
procedures, the seemingly anodyne quarrel about an unspecified legal question, which forces the aristocrats to choose their sides and pluck the white rose to show their support of the Duke of York or a red rose to support Somerset. It could or not have been added by Shakespeare to introduce the sect, the seeds of the quarrel, and anachronistically mm -hmm. its antagonists with um, the second part of Henry the Sixth and Anachronistically, because one of the Warwick was supported in three at the time. But we cannot be sure. And if it is an addition, we cannot date it. The Inner Temple Gardens were revamped in 1591, which might have been the reason why it was used as a setting for the first scene, for that scene in the first place. So we don't know, the scene might be original. Editors since Malone have dismissed the quarters and the cover of the first part of the convention and the two tragedies as bad quarters based on memorial reconstruction or poor as poor transcriptions of lost manuscripts. Um, and they still, and they, they tend now to be considered as alternative versions of it. The photo text is usually, is much longer than the photo text for both plays. Um, and as a consequence, the photo is used as a comic text for all modern editions of these plays. Um, unless I'm mistaken, as representing what is considered closest to authorial intentions. The recent work that, done by the Oxford Shakespeare team has confirmed through the scholarship that suggested teamwork rather than a single author, but the relationship between the quarter and failure text is not really clarified, although it seems established that the failure text is not derived from the quarter. On the whole, the quarter texts tend to be more theatrically oriented than the folio with full stage directions. The folio texts offer alternative versions of the same scenes. In Henry the Sixth Part Two, some passages appeared in toned down versions of the folio, perhaps because the topics would have been perceived more politically sensitive in a JPM in, in context. I can give two examples here. The conjuration of spirits in Act 1, Scene 4 of the second part of the number 6, which is much longer in the quarter version, is a bridge in the folio and given a vague permissive state direction, perhaps to avoid the spiking of these conjuring spirits, the invocation. Um, it's not a dialogue that is actually left out. Molly Brook and Southwell reads conjure at a Yeah, you have it from the first quotation here on the slide. The second, but I'll skip that. The second example, in the second example, there's a political illusion to the fact that York might easily win popular support for his uprising that is turned down. It's not this um, slide. Sorry. In most cases, however, the portrait and photo texts follow a similar plot line, but the photo simply takes its time. The longer speeches speak on the form for more character development, which does in the end reinforce the unity between episodes. This is most visible in the articulation of perhaps between the third part of the this is so rich in the third, which appears to be strengthened by the illusion in the folio of speeches being given to which the cluster. At the end of the second part of the music, Shake Shakespeare had already quite anachronistically made of Richard the murder of Somerset, although he saw that he would only have been skewed at the time. This introduces him as one of the main warriors um, in, in, in the struggles in, of the second part. In the third part of Henry VI, his brooding presence is heightened by, it's highlighted, sorry, by a number of other sides, and he's given two long soliloquies. One in particular, the unidentified amount of the beloved speech in Axiom Scene 2, is much longer in the folio than in the portrait. 71 lines versus 30 lines. Sorry, not the portrait, the other family. This long speech anticipates um, Richard's final soliloquy in Act 5, Scene 6, that 30 lines, same in the folio and the portrait um, texts, I am myself alone. 
but soliloquy serve to upstage a character who then becomes the main protagonist following the play. But these speeches, self battling are in fact echoed by the very similar opening speech in Richard the Third. Modern performances of the plays and the series usually skip Richard's last soliloquy in the third part of Henry the Sixth because they're too close to each other. So while the two soliloquies of the third part are necessary to two plays of form distant in time, repetition repetition is not performed in this case. When the plays are performed in this way, at this range, this is duplicate material that needs to be true. So this, I think, suggests that the third part of Henry the Sixth, the Sixth and Richard the Third, were probably not performed, <coughs> were not meant to be performed in this succession. And of course, we know that Richard the Third is usually performed as a completely new performance play. In a recent Study of the Plato situation. The recent study, Tiffany Stern, suggests that critics and editors studying the Plato texts, which he sees them as competent, must be attuned to traits of earliness, reflecting moments of early performance and in publication, as well as places of lateness, which, whenever conceivable, might indicate successive layers of revisions. This must be true of the second and third part of the the six, too. The names of actors of the Admiral's men finding their ways into a couple of stage directions point towards earnings. More sophisticated and systematic sound effects in the very effects testify to the more frequent use of musical instruments in JP and performance. The regularization of the text, presentation, the consistent that is applied to the presentation of characters can be considered to be effects of lateness. So, for instance, of so the division in acts, which is more or less systematic in the period, but was perhaps introduced at composition stage to regularize the presentation of all plays by aligning them onto the classical model. But as shown by Gary Taylor, it also, this division in act also reflects the actual practice at the indoor flat fires when the kings were performed in the winter season from 1608 to onwards, where act breaks were needed to trim or change the candles. In the case of the first part of Henry V, this division in acts is problematic. The mention of Act 5 is obviously, was obviously introduced as an afterthought. For just the last scene of the play, which seems here to rule out the authorial intervention completely for, for this um, manipulation test. The overall regularization also concerns the state directions, which are abridged and include some of what might qualify as Tiffany Sterling's reader directions. State direction meant for the reader rather than the actor. Which points toward late towards lateness. One example could be the conjuring of spirits, so slide that's on here, um, which I mentioned about more likely to make be read uh, than before. This doesn't give you any indication about how it must be taken. Another example concerns Act 41, alarm fight at sea, ordinance goes off, enter left then and suffer in others. At the quarter stage direction is much more precise and factual. The lines within chains be discharged, like as it were a fight at sea, and then enter the captain of the ship and the master of the master's mate and the Duke of Norfolk, his guys, and others with him, and water with more. No, so the further direction, the further state direction is incomplete. Not only is the sea fight led to the imagination of the reader rather than suggested by sounds. But it leaves out two vital pieces of information, such as the disguise and the entry of Walter Whitmore, who, as prophesied earlier, will kill Suffolk. All we can conclude from this to be survey is that the folio texts are profoundly untangled texts, which contain elements of earliness as well as lateness, authorial as well as editorial. So now to conclude, it's time to come back to my initial question. 
In spite of the tantalizing case of the four parts of this civil war in Rome, oh, sorry, of France, the civil wars of France, which were written as a sequence over a relatively short time and might have been performed, if or not, on consecutive day, at least at a very close range. Um, this was not the case, unfortunately, it was the first of Paladin. The stage and publishing histories do not confirm Green's intuition that they must have been designed serial production with lazy in mind. The two parts of Henry VI, two second and third parts of Henry VI are a pair. The other two plays have an in independent history. Yes, the publishing history of the portraits shows how a few stakeholders promoted serialized history as a marketing strategy. So when the various editors, basing themselves on Peter's photos and on new manuscripts, produced the slick series that we know today, they could rely on the fact that readers had found them really tuned to reading and to some collecting serial histories. For those readers who had bought some of the earlier installments, the appeal of the play would have been irresistible. It seemed indeed to offer the final complete, complete series of English history plays for the first time published in the right order from the modern world event, including one that had never appeared in the book. So perhaps I can better understand the stroke of genius of the friendly editors, in particular the retailing that went into the editorial presentation of the histories, if not from the interview texts themselves. The new focus on rainy monarchs visible through the altered title right from the beginning um, from the table of contents constructs an illusion of coherence and unity. The catalog repackages the set of histories as, as a county uniform place, other numbers in a series, one, two, three, one, two, or plays about the life of the life and death of the kings. By creating this homogenous series, the photo consecrates the figure of Shakespeare, the English historian, making the characters systematic tapping into the chronicles as source material. It's sometimes believed that the photo legitimized the minor genre of the history by showing how extensively it was practiced by the great Shakespeare. Well, perhaps we should see it the other way, the other way around. The central section dedicated to the histories in the folio is perhaps the core of the editor's project, of the folio editor's project, um, out of a genre that had once been extremely popular, emerged Shakespeare, the poet of England, even if that implied appropriating, appropriating plays he had not written or written in collaboration. Thank you very much. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we've got around 15 minutes for questions. Um, so, shall I go on to the next one? Or well, some of you will be Do you want to see more stories? I'm happy to, uh, I have questions, so I'm very happy to, to open these up to the world, I think. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that was really fascinating. Uh, I really love this idea that seriality is actually actually a sort of retrospective operation in some way. And actually, um, when plays emerge, they are much more contingent. And you know, if they're successful, then. And so, I, I had two questions. I think about that what, one was: Does this mean then that the endings of lots of early modern plays are kind of not really only at this, but also replete with possibility? That they too might, if they had done better, been extended and become a kind of so maybe endings are not straightforwardly only endings now, thinking about it. And then the other thought was just that so seriality is, is retrospective, that is, 
it knits together things so that they belong together, but it can kind of only do that from a distance, then, then maybe, so maybe it's actually an instrument of reception rather than of production. And so actually perhaps seriality, if anything, says something like, be very careful here with these plays. They are thickly temporal. And although they seem to be together, they may not exactly. But those are some thoughts. Thank you. have two very absolutely fascinating points that you're making. Um, yeah, um, I really like your point that um, the fact that any, any play can be turned into a pair. Or I mean, that's the impression we get by reading and stuff, isn't it? I mean, you, you've looked at other archival material. I mean, would, would you say that this? Um, is also confirmed by your experience of uh, early modern state history. Of all of modern or the time of actually history? Archive of in shape of time. Um, but um, I think that you're absolutely right that in a way we need to think about these plays as much more contingent than, than we think they are. In many cases, um, of course, we still don't know the amount of revision that came into play. But we, when we compare the Porto's, the Porto texts with the Porto texts in the, in these particular cases, which I I looked at, I was surprised at how little, in a way, I and mean, there's a lot of revision, the alternative versions, but um, there's a lot more revision that could have been done to tighten up the loose. Uh, threads and it's not that so it's right everything relative i suppose so but but the effect of the uh, seriality is very much an illusion from a distance is when you start pouring over the development but there are no steps i'm not really asking you your there were reference to many of the comments <laughs> but thank you i think it's so interesting from that Thank you very much. I really enjoyed that. Um, and my friend kind of links to the previous point, which is also your point. And um, it's that any play, it's, it's, I think it's true to say that any play uh, couldn't see the sequel theoretically, or also couldn't see another version of itself. It could be rewritten, you know, the same story that could be told elsewhere. But I think it's also true, and hence those accounts show this. That even when there's a very, very explicit pair, that is still not to say that they will, will be paired in the performance. I think it's yeah. the point that, that, that you've made in there. The exact same like place can be wrong. Well, we've got a very clear uh, pair of those plays in the three. You can't buy it as a solo play. And we see when it gets revised for the first time in 1594, it's the first time it appears in Hen's Solo's account. Yeah. Only the first play. And it's months before it becomes the second. And then they get played together as a pair along with the pair in these parts of the and all the rest of it. As far as I remember, the second's never on it. So there's something interesting there about Campbell and Campbell and the four of us Campbell and part one, it retrospectively becomes Campbell and part one, but it can move more freely than part two, which is kind of always so fixed, even though it doesn't have to be, and you could do that as a standalone play, but it can still work. And I guess, I mean, I'm not sure what the question is from there, but so that's those some of the things that yeah, I was thinking about as we talk about those examples. And I guess I wonder, do you see? You can kind of answer it part of the idea 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 of the I mean, for instance, um, I mean, I think that the Civil Wars of France, and that's the only instance I found of a play that was actually um, immediately called first part, not just um, something else. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an seems to be an indication of the fact that they were super present so, as a thing. Um, but there are yeah, and four as well. To have so, to have so many, to put three of them in the picture is a very big unusual thing. I think it's a compliment that work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, I don't know 
how many claims it takes to make a series vertically? <laughs> if we take two, I'm thinking of one uh, playwright who did it very self consciously, which is Lord Tubman, uh, in his uh, conspiracy and tragedy of Byron, published together in 1608. Uh, there were what's interesting is that they're both self contained plays in themselves, but they are. Uh, intention lenses work in, as, as a series. And of course, the other example is uh, the fact that he wrote a revenge of Blasted Dumbledore's after a round of the tragedy of Blasted Dumbledore. So, in, in, in any case, he was not self conscious. So, yeah. Can I just add on to that? I mean, it's just it's just with regard to the question of this, it's just with regard to the question of um your point about all early modern plays could have their sequels. The answer is no. <laughs> there are sequels that have been made already, and there are people like Johnson who have already, you know, enshrined their burdens and their final intentions or their endings in a particular place. What he has done though has finally been to thank you so much, bring some doubt into these retrospective hindsight wishful thinking, serial thinking into, into what factually looks um, a little less likely. So thank you. Thank you. I do think that there's a difference and there's a very important chronological difference to make between the early shape and the 1590s, where everything is in flux. And then from 1594, where we have to be companies, uh, things begin to sort of settle down. And then um, and things change. I don't know how you would feel about that, that. There's a sense that, that the and if you, the situation in the early, in the early 17th century is not the same as the one we live in the late uh, 50s, 90s. Ah, and um, oh, there might be there might be a reason for this. Yes, and then you have of this there are lots of reasons. <laughs> And there's also the case, and you can't really compare uh, this chat with this platform, all the time with a capital A. That's it. Huh? Very so very we're talking about different models of all the shit. And here we're talking about um, a very sort of volatile period, the African media, where horses are not even credited, when, you know, when they write. By the way, Johnson was part of that branch. He's eventually Johnson. I know, but state Chaucer, Chaucer, the state's version of Chaucer came out in uh, 1598 and then was republished in 1602. The authorial figure was coming into being, you know, very much at that point. Anyway, but yes, go ahead. Yeah. As you said, well, this was the uh, so interesting and so rich. Thank you very much. Okay. I was thinking, uh, of course, this young reality may be an art of thought. As you said, we don't know when or by whom the decisions were made, including possibly shifting herself at some point. And I was thinking that possibly, probably, the author uh, was following also his own agenda, his own sort of process. As you said, things changed after 1590. Uh, it's, um, I would say, slightly that the second series of uh, history answered questions that could not be dealt with when you came to the edge of the Tudor race. So that would mean that even if they're set chronologically before uh, Henry the Sixth, plays like Richard the Second or Henry the Fifth, answer questions that could not be done mm -hmm. earlier. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you very much. I absolutely agree with that. Um, again, coming back to the question of uh, the situation. As you said, too many reasons. We don't know half of them and then we're there. The change of the one of them, but also I think that the theatrical you 
thesis and the status of the author that's important as we say in the comprehension. Yeah. 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 And I'm a little bit, I guess, it's actually not the answer. So, kind of like people, people, <laughs> what would you, because that's not quite relationship because it was, sometimes it might be, but we have any handle about how to negotiate that. So, I, I don't know how to do it. It's something like, oh, so in this space, even sequel seems to be not always necessarily what's going on. They're talking to parts of it, so I'm not there. I just wonder if you had any, any thoughts on what you do, what seems sometimes kind of almost intractable. Kind of obviously, like, realize, try to write this paper that the knowledge is so limited, we need to critically examine the terms that we need to be in strategies. It's not descriptive at all. It, it is a uh, way to impose a shape on something which. Might function differently. And why not get off the good series differently? I mean, if you have only the fifth and the three hundred and six, why not instead of always seeing it, uh, seeing the Henry the Sixth linked with the rich, with the anyway. Um, so yeah, um, prequel, sequel, absolutely. These are also terms that need to be questioned. Um, I think you don't know, but <laughs> but. but it's, that, that really, I mean, what, what one of the great things I, I see, I, I see, understood, you know, great modesty, that it's really how much of this was actually governed by, by popular demand, and that really the, the historical material was liked and, and successful, and people came returning to the theater to see more. So the authors gave them more, you know, as long as it works. And that in a way, they, they sort of haphazardly, you know, made their ways into the chronicles. And that basically they had to look to sort of turn to passages that had not been used before in order to find new material, if you like. So, so there's a lot about, about um, these history plays about England, which, which has to do with the chronicles themselves that, that were available and how they presented the material and how what what parts had already been done and what other parts could be could be done in order to offer something different but still related so that people would know how to place them how to place the play in what in, in relation to what they had already seen. I found that so fascinating. I don't know what they do, but I think it's a long period that people have the same experience as I have. Whenever I have seen the complete sequence of any of the same and Richard III, Richard the Third never works anywhere as well as it, when it is done independently. Because of all that has happened in there before, he doesn't seem such a fascinating master. I don't know if I've heard that I had the same you know, experience in the theater. Uh, just the, that discussion about what's the right language makes me think a bit about um, other kinds of sort of spin offs or responses and how they belong within this way of thinking. I suppose what one of the stories around Mary Wives of Windsor is that it's a it's a summoning of Falstaff again, and, a, and so a kind of continuation and response in some senses of, of an earlier story. But then there's something about well, what's the story that you're continuing? Because it's a different narrative. There's a kind of continuation there in some form. I don't even know if you could biographically put them together very well mm -hmm. if you were to assemble a kind of Falstaff biography. I don't know how easy that would be. But, but so I suppose maybe that's when genre comes in because if you're going to continue a history play, well, there's a certain type of story there that you need to continue in performance. If you're going to continue a character story, then they've sort of got the potential to walk into a slightly different scenario, maybe. Well, we have both, I think, in that period mm. character plays, mm. you know, 
characters being I mean, who, who gets resuscitated literally like like Bossa in different ways and which do not correspond to the historical model. You know, they do not that's that's not a historical model. It's not a historical. And there are other examples. I think that it's a theater that was trying all sorts of different recipes and they they did whatever worked. That's fascinating. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just, I just, <clears throat> I'm so sorry, but you're talking about a very important idea of terms. What terms do you think well spin off and whatever? And again, going back to Johnson, sorry, but he did create a series himself with every man in his humor, every man out of his humor, and then much later. The Magnetic Lady, which is subtitled The Humor's Reconciled. And so, in a way, he is making sure that everybody understands that this is an ongoing, you know, um, yeah. And, and I, I just think that the example of Johnson is, is useful to see the extent to which we know so little about Shakespeare's um, or the Shakespearean um, intentions. Final or other ones? Did you, did you say that, like Chapman, Johnson had to reach the state where he could be prescriptive rather than um, obey the laws of the market, as it were, or yeah. the, the conditions that he was given by the It is very interesting to wonder at what point, you know, he was even thinking at the Porto stage. Of the final binding of the poem. Because there is a very yeah, there's that between the quarto of every man in, which is basically Italian, and the folio version, which is English. But then by the time he gets to every man out, I think he's pretty much already thinking that. And it's clear that the um the masks, which came you know, later. Um, he was already thinking in Porto of their inclusion in a folio. I'm sure of it. But we don't know exactly when. Right. I'm really sorry, but I'm going to have to talk into a close there because I think we have two very good coming up. Such things are important. And well, that's thank you for the fact that they're going to be continuing to get those